I guess that's true. Yeah. <laughs> it is way, way better than getting it. <laughs> it doesn't sound fun, whatever it is. No. Certainly yeah. Not. Yeah. So um, anyway, doing good. Good, good. All right. Let's get started here. And uh, do, 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 do. Okay, here we go. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome again to Dressing Gettysburg. And we have with us uh, one of our favorite guests to have on the show, uh, Scott Hartwig. Hello, Scott. Hello. Uh, good to be here. It's good, good to have you, as always. Um, I Every once in a while, I go, it's time to have Scott back on. And I'll go scour the internet to see something that you might have written that would be interesting to have you talk about. And I sent you... I forgot what it was, but for some reason it came up when I searched your name um, and it was something somebody else had written and I sent you a link to it and I said, would you want to come on and talk about this? You're like, well, I don't really know a lot about that because I didn't write that, you moron. (laughs) (laughs) But you did recommend what we're talking about today. It was uh, an article that you wrote for the Park Service blog in October of 2011 it's called The Romances of Gettysburg, Get Those Shoes. And I was so glad to see that you had written something on this topic because it is one of these things that just plagues us all when you when you meet someone, especially when they're new to it. And it's nothing against them because it's not their fault. But, you know, they'll say, oh, I can't believe this was all fought over shoes. But it, but it wasn't all fought over shoes. So... Explain where did you? What made you decide to to write this, and uh, and what was it really about? Where does the shoe myth come from? Well, if if you do any casual reading about Gettysburg, um, even even some decent books that have been written about Gettysburg in the past, you will almost always encounter the story that on July the first, Henry Heath, who commanded an infantry division, one of the nine divisions in Robert E. Lee's Army, in Northern Virginia came to Gettysburg on July the 1st for the purpose of securing a supply of shoes that he had learned were in the town and that his men needed shoes badly. So he marched to go get those shoes. He was taken completely by surprise that the Union Army was there and the battle was precipitated and it wasn't Heath's fault. It was just, you know, they didn't have the intelligence they needed. And the, the kind of Amusing, comical part of this is that for really question, well, there were some people, but historians didn't question Heath's account. They right. generally accepted Heath's account of why he came to Gettysburg on July the 1st. So why did they do that? I think part of the reason why people did it, I mean, was it's a, it's a fun story and it's an easy way to remember how a huge battle begins. And people love those sort of ironic things. Here we have one of the biggest battles that ever occurs in North America, and it's fought because the Confederates were marching to Gettysburg looking for shoes. <laughs> it's, it's preposterous. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. Yes. And if you were uh, one of the very early guides at Gettysburg, what an easy way to explain to people how the battle came on. Right. Well, the Confederates were just coming here looking for shoes. Very easy. So I think it was the convenience of this simple story that you could tell. People love simple stories with history, and they didn't want to get into the complications of it. And it came from a veteran, and he was the commander of the division that came here. So why would he possibly not be telling the truth? It wasn't really until Edwin Coddington published the Gettysburg Campaign in 1968, I think was the year that came out. Uh, Coddington did question Heath's story. Even though Coddington still couldn't even resist inserting the story in there about how he was going to get those shoes on July the first, right. so it it, it um, it's kind of like the um, the other famous myth of Gettysburg about the the hooves on the equestrian statues on the monuments and the equestrian monuments in the battlefield. One hoof up, he was wounded. Two hoofs up, he was killed. All four down, he made it through the battle. Okay, that all four was. All four. All, all four up. Uh, there aren't any. So <laughs> he was no. You he, find, he was. You the, find one of them. <laughs> all four up. He was in the Air Force. <laughs> yeah. So um, you know that's one of those. Uh, again, one of those cases where I'm sure, early in the guiding period at Gettysburg, if you were a guide, 
what what an easy way to tell people okay if you want to remember what happened to these people if you see one hoof up on the equestrian that means he was wounded because there's one monument like that or there's two or there's one and then there's one with two hooves up that was general reynolds he was killed all four down those guys made it through the battle so you tell that story over decades and people go home and they say, hey, I went to Gettysburg. That's a cool story I learned. Blah, blah, blah. So they tell a story. So the shoe myth is kind of like that. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's an easy thing to go home and tell. And then that gets spread around. And once it gets spread and permeates the, the culture of your history, it's very, very difficult to dispel it. Because people believe, now want to believe they that want it's to. true. Yeah. And, and you're just a revisionist when you question it. Right. So, right. So, okay, let's let's separate fact from myth then. Was there ever any talk about possibly finding shoes in Gettysburg among Heath's uh, div in Heath's division or between Heath and Hill or anything? Where yes. There was. Okay, there so was. that is a fact. That is a fact. Okay. Uh, but but it wasn't on July the 1st. <laughs> Correct. All right, so go ahead. What, what, what was it? it? It was on June 30th, right. the day before. The day before the battle begins, General Heath's division had marched over South Mountain to Cashtown Pass, and they had bivouacked around Cashtown, which is about eight, nine miles west of Gettysburg. And on June 30th, uh, General Heath ordered his largest brigade, which was commanded by General James Pettigrew. It was about almost 3,000 men, to take a bunch of wagons from the division and march to Gettysburg. And they were to search the town for supplies, but particularly Heath had learned that there was some sort of a supply of shoes, and he wanted those shoes. So again, one of the, you know, the perpetual myths of the Confederate Army is most of these guys didn't wear shoes. That's simply not true. The reason that Heath needed shoes was the same reason that Union Division commanders needed shoes for their men. Many of the roads in Maryland and Pennsylvania, the good roads were macadamized roads. And macadamized roads was crushed stone with packed dirt on top of it. Mm. That meant it was an all-weather road. So if you were on the Chambersburg Turnpike, that was a macadamized road. If you were on the Tawny Town Road, that was a county road, that was a dirt road, that would turn into a mud pie if it rained a lot. So they don't have that same base. But that base, that that uh, rock base with packed dirt on top of it, was very difficult for somebody in bare feet to walk on mm. for any, any length of time. So your soldiers would become lame and you needed to get shoes for your men. And the other thing was for a division commander like Heath, shoes that he's going to obtain in Pennsylvania are going to be better manufactured than anything he's going to get through the Confederate supply system. Okay. So he wants to get all the shoes that he possibly can obtain. So he Pettigrew is ordered to search for supplies, but particularly for shoes on June 30th. He is, of course, going to march towards Gettysburg that day. Uh, he got warned twice on the way to Gettysburg. By One was a Confederate sympathizer mm. from Gettysburg. The other, they said, was a spy in the employ of Longstreet, which could have been Harrison, Harrison. the spy. We don't know, but um, both of them warned him that federal cavalry was approaching Gettysburg from the south. And one of them, it might have been Harrison, told him who it was. He said it was Buford's division of cavalry from the Army of the Potomac. So that put Pettigrew on the alert. Pettigrew halted his division uh, almost two miles from Gettysburg, and he advanced with a skirmish line up to the Lutheran Seminary on Seminary Ridge. And when he got to Seminary Ridge and when he looked to the south or southeast towards the Emmitsburg Road, which comes up to Gettysburg from the south, he saw cavalry uh, coming up, probably the advance guard of Buford's division. So that confirmed for Pettigrew that what he had been warned about was actually coming to pass. There was some type of cavalry approaching Gettysburg. And one of his staff uh, members also believed he heard drums in Gettysburg. Mm. And it, there was a little band that came out to kind of celebrate Buford <laughs> coming into town. So maybe those were the guys playing the drum. There was, there was no infantry in town, but uh, Pettigrew's staff officer believed that might indicate that there was some infantry. They didn't know, was this militia or was this from the Army of the Potomac? 
but Pettigrew turned everybody around and he started to march back to Cashtown. And while he was doing so, he stayed near the rear of his column to personally observe the cavalry, which shadowed his movements. And by watching the cavalry, he was convinced that the cavalry was from the Army of the Potomac. They moved like trained soldiers, not like militia. Okay. So when he returns to Cashtown and reports to General Heath, his report is going to be, I could not enter Gettysburg because there was a large cavalry force occupied the town. And that cavalry force, I'm quite certain, is from the Army of the Potomac. Now, Pettigrew had served with the Army of Northern Virginia uh, through the through the Seven Days Battles. Okay. But when the Army of Northern Virginia left the peninsula and they began to move north in the Second Manassas Campaign, Pettigrew's brigade did not accompany the army. And Pettigrew did not serve with the army until June of 1863, a year later. Okay. So he misses Second Manassas, Antietam, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville. So if you're in Heath's shoes, Pettigrew is, he's just not that experienced, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, he's had combat under his belt. He's not that experienced. He might be exaggerating and seeing things and stuff that really isn't as dangerous as he thinks. So Heath doubted his report, uh, the whether he was accurate. He was didn't doubt that he might have run into something, but he doubted that it was from the Army of the Potomac. And then when A.P. Hill arrived, the Corps commander, he comes up a little while, probably towards late afternoon, maybe evening of July of June 30th. Pettigrew is going to give his report to General Hill as well. And General Hill is also going to doubt that Pettigrew saw what he what he actually saw, which was cavalry from the Army of the Potomac. Um, and Hill tells him that he'd just come from a meeting with Lee and that Lee's scouts confirmed what A.P. Hill's scouts had already told him, which was the main body of the Army of the Potomac was still down in Maryland, probably about 20 miles from the Pennsylvania line. And they hadn't even, uh, you know, they hadn't even taken down their tents yet. So Hill was convinced that if there was anything in Gettysburg, it was just an observation force. And, um, but of course, he felt that they needed to do something about it. So the, so there is this element of truth Pettigrew does go to Gettysburg on June 30th to search Gettysburg for supplies and also for shoes. And he's not going to find anything because he's going to discover Union cavalry is there. And then that's where the story then begins to get complicated. And the individual who's going to complicate it is Henry Heath. So so who does he talk to? Who does he talk to? And uh, uh, how does it get complicated? So why why is it? turning into this, uh, how, how, why, why is the myth being born here? How, how does that happen? It gets complicated because um, if you follow the timeline of how the shoe myth story begins, it makes much more sense than if you just simply go back to a document and look at it. So mm. in 1877, the uh, Comte de Paris, who was a, a French nobleman who had actually served as a volunteer aide on the staff of George B. McClellan during the Peninsula Campaign. The Comte de Paris was very interested in the war and he wanted to write uh, he wanted to write a history of the war. And he corresponded with he had a lot of contacts, uh, both Union and Confederate. And he carried on an extensive correspondence. So it's important to realize at this point, if you follow the Civil War at all, many people have heard of something called the ORs, mm. which is the official records. It is the War of the Rebellion the compilation of the official records of the Union and Confederate armies in the Civil War. What that is, is all of the most important correspondence that uh, takes place at the army level for the most part, sometimes at core, maybe division level, um, but certainly at army level and also to their, their central governments. Um, it's all a correspondence for the entire war, and it is all of the after-action reports, because if you were a Union or Confederate Army officer and you were engaged in an operation or an action, you were obligated by law, even though sometimes people didn't do it, 
you're obligated by law to write an after action report about that. And we call those the official reports. So after a big battle like Gettysburg, um, everyone who was the surviving commanding officer from regiment, brigade, division, corps, army, battery, everyone was supposed to write a report. Write a report. Not everybody did, but most people did. All of those reports were then compiled into the official records of the War of the Rebellion. So, for example, the Gettysburg Campaign is volume 27 of the official records. It's three parts, and it's over 3,000 pages. <laughs> so that can give you some idea of the, the extent of documentation we're talking about. Yeah. Those are not going to be published until the late 1880s. All right? So that's an important fact to understand. And he's talking to the Comte de Paris in the 1870s? 77. 77. He doesn't have access to these reports. Okay. He doesn't have access to AP, AP Hill's report. He doesn't have access to Henry Heath's report. What he has access to is Henry Heath. He can write Henry Heath. Mm. And Henry Heath, uh, he wants Henry Heath to write an article for him. And Henry Heath is going to write an article about the how the Battle of Gettysburg began. So if you were Henry Heath, there, there was criticism of your management of your division on July the 1st within the Confederate Army after the battle was over. Okay. It was a feeling as if Heath had mismanaged the operation and he had allowed Lee to stumble into a battle. So if you're Heath, 1877, post-war Confederacy, you are trying to um, shape the memory of this battle and your role in it. Okay. So Heath is going to try and do two things with this article. The first he's going to do is to make the point that the only reason I went to Gettysburg on July the 1st, July the 1st, was to search the town for shoes. He doesn't say anything about Pettigrew going on June 30th. Aha. Uh-huh. Right. He he. Well, he actually I, I take that back. He does. He mentions Pettigrew went there. He mentions that Pettigrew had seen some cavalry there. He mentions that A.P. Hill kind of discounted the cavalry. And then uh, he says that he's he commented to A.P. Hill. Well, then, do you mind if I take my division there tomorrow? Do you have any reservations about that? And he said A.P. Hill replied, none in the world. Now, when you look at the way military organizations operated in the Civil War. That that um, discussion that Heath mentions is absolutely preposterous. <laughs> we're, ta- we're talking about uh, one of nine divisions of Lee's army, 7,000 men operating in enemy territory. Lee's army did not operate that way. There might be some things that would be a little bit casual, but you don't take an entire division and march to Gettysburg to look look for supplies. That never is going to happen. It just isn't going to happen. Your corps commander is going to have a plan on what you're doing. So that was the first, that would be the first red flag. When you see that, you realize that maybe Heath is is, is trying to um, take any sort of blame off of him because look, I just, this is all I was doing and my court commander approved it. My court commander, who by the way, was killed in 1865. Right, he can't defend himself. <laughs> can't defend himself, yeah. right? So, and then the second thing that he does in this is he said, you know, I never would have stumbled into the enemy if Jeb Stewart had been doing his job. Another dead guy. Right. So Jeb Stewart that's the pro, that's the reason. That's why we stumbled into this battle. It never would have happened if Stewart had been there to do his job. So uh, the person who defended Jeb Stewart was John Mosby, the Grey Ghost, mm-hmm. and Mosby is going to write uh, a rebuttal to what Henry Heath wrote, and he's going to publish it in 1878. He actually wrote to the Southern Historical Society papers. And he also wrote to the Philadelphia Weekly Times, which was the publication that published Heath's article. And the Mosby, despite the fact that he was one of the, you know, one of the best warriors in the Confederacy, after the war was over, he became a Republican. Yeah. And he was a pariah in much of the South. So the Southern Historical uh, Society papers refused to print his rebuttal. But the Philadelphia Weekly Times did. And... 
in that in that article, what Mosby said is that, you know, Heath, you're full of hooey. You know, um, you mismanaged this operation. You skirmished with Buford's cavalry for nearly two hours before Reynolds infantry reached the field. Heath is going to respond to that. And again, it's important to remember when Heath is responding, he's responding knowing full well Jeb Stewart's dead, AP Hill's dead, and nobody's after action reports are publicly available. Mm-hmm. I can write anything I want. Mm-hmm. Buford's I was dead there. too. I was there. Yeah. So Heath, Heath is going to respond and say, I never even had so much as any any form of a of a of a uh, contact with Buford's cavalry. Never ran into him. Right. I don't, I don't even know what you're talking about. So he, I mean, it's clearly a lie because uh, it's going to be, we're going to know it's a lie because eventually when the official records are published, Heath's report is going to say it completely differently <laughs> than what he's writing to, to Mosby. So um, this is kind of how the the story gets gets started. So, and you, that's a good point. So the official records, uh, does he know, are they being compiled at that time when he's talking to the Comte de Paris or are they... Is this a known thing? Like, what's the the story behind the ORs? Like, when do they? When does that idea come about? How that long? There, um, I would not. They would start compiling them in the early 1880s. Okay. So when he's okay. corresponding with the Comte de Paris and with uh, John Mosby, that's before he knows that they're going to get the ORs and they're going to actually publish the ORs. Right. So he's he's getting um, away with it as far as he knows right now. He's getting away with it okay. as far as he knows. Right. Um, AP Hill, though. <clears throat> um, well, I guess this would this would come out more when the ORs come out. Um, when they do come out, uh, we have Heath's report and we have AP Hill's report. AP Hill characterizes it as a reconnaissance in force, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Based on Pettigrew's report. Right. Um, so he's not blindly or carelessly sending that division like – like Heath is saying that he did or, right. or implying that he did. Right. Um, he wants to find out, well, is that true? What is in Gettysburg? Let's send the division just in case. Right. Is that right. that's so that's the reality of it. Yeah. Is AP. Yeah. The rea- the re- yeah. The reality is that it wasn't a casual, Hey, can I take my 7,000 guys go to Gettysburg and see if I can get those shoes? It, it, there was a plan. So the, the plan and the plan also, uh, AP Hill mentions in his report that he communicated with army headquarters. Right. So, he, he, so army and headquarters. He, right. So there is a definite plan on July the 1st. The plan is Heath's two divisions are going to conduct a reconnaissance in force and, or Heath and Pender, AP Hill's two divisions are going to conduct a reconnaissance in force. And AP Hill also has the knowledge that Yule is going to direct the march of his. He had two divisions north of Gettysburg, Early's Division and Rhodes, and their orders were to march to Cashtown. Mm-hmm. So the way you would march to Cashtown would be through present-day Biglerville. That would be your best route to go, which is eight miles north of Gettysburg. But based upon the communication that Yule has with AP Hill, what he's going to do is instead direct. Mm-hmm. Early and Rhodes to march through Gettysburg, then to Cashtown. Mm. So, what does that mean? Well, if AP Hill is coming in from the west, if he runs into a problem and he runs into resistance, it means Early and Rhodes will come in the rear of the enemy because they're coming from the north. They'll come in behind them. And it's a good, I, I think yep. it was a really good plan. It was a very good plan. It also, was four of the nine divisions of the army are converging on Gettysburg. So again, I cannot imagine that Robert E. Lee did not approve this plan. You can't take that large part of the army without the army commander's knowledge and approval to to uh, to a position that was forward of where Lee was directing the concentration of the army. So I think that Lee, like A.P. Hill, they were taking precautions, but they didn't actually see any danger in this movement. Okay. Yeah, right, because AP Hill has intelligence from Lee that it's probably militia, that the the Union Army is far away, 
So this can't be anything big, but let's go see anyway, just in case. Right. Um, Oh, I just had a question and it slipped my mind. Damn it. Uh, Oh, well, so how much of this stuff, uh, you know, Heath has this, well, Stuart wasn't there. uh, My poor boys needed shoes and, you know, all this stuff. And did the uh, lost cause religion like kind of hone in on that as, as uh, okay, well, this is something good here because now it can be like these poor shoeless Southern boys are just trying to get something for their tired feet. And uh, Lee was failed by uh, Stuart and everything. And is that another reason why maybe this has become part of the story of Gettysburg is it's been perpetrated? I, I through- think it's less. I think it's I, I don't know that lost co- the lost cause enters into this. I think okay. it's more uh, AP Hill or not AP Hill. Henry Heath is attempting to shape the memory of how this battle comes on. And he's he's using the mediums. And the lack of knowledge that people have and the fact that he's one of the only surviving key witnesses. Because mm. also remember, Dorsey Pender is also dead. Mm-hmm. He's going to die of his wounds at Gettysburg. Right. So Pender, the other division commander, is gone. AP Hill, the corps commander, is gone. Jeb Stewart is gone. Lee is dead mm-hmm. by this point. Yep. Yule is Yule is gone. There's no one at all who can refute what, it, what Henry Heath is saying. Pettigrew has gone. Pettigrew's gone. So yeah, you're right. right. He's the <laughs> he's the only one. Archer's Archer's gone. Archer's yeah. died. Yeah. The other brigade commander. I mean, so there there literally is no one who is going to be able to refute. Well, there are people who could. Right. But Heath also knows that it's unlikely that anyone's going to do that. So if this is really more about, um, I'm worried about how I'm going to be perceived in history. And I don't want to be perceived as the person who brought on the battle that we lost that maybe changed the course of the history of the Confederate States of America. Right. I, I'd rather Jeb Stewart wears that mantle. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, sure. So so uh, when the ORs come out, uh, does, does he get any, for lack of a better term, shit for it? Or does it just kind of, what goes on with that? Well, I mean, that, that's a really good question because it is possible that he did. I okay. mean, um, we don't have all of AP or we don't have all of Henry Heath's papers. Uh, we don't he may not have even saved everything that he got there. there. And there's also, um, you know, the process of going through newspapers mm. in the late 1800s and early 1900s. It's there's a lot of great material in there. But, oh, my God, it takes yeah. It takes a tremendous amount of time. And it is possible that there were some people who wrote some things about Heath's account uh, that he had published in the Philadelphia Weekly Times in 1877. I mean, it, it is possible. It's possible that he got some letters from some people. But um, he stuck to his guns. And in 1892, he's going to publish his memoirs. He needed money at that point. He was also sick. He's going to die, um, I think, before they were published of Bright's disease. And uh, so he's not he's not in good health. Uh, We don't know what the status of his memory was based on his memoirs. It wasn't very good. Whether that was whether that was a uh, age or whether that was deliberate, we don't know. But he had. well, his memoirs are so unreliable that um, if you're a historian and you're writing about the battle, you really shouldn't use them mm. because they're 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 not they're um, they're clearly Heath attempting to shape how we remember the battle, and he had all sorts of details about it that were completely wrong. Yeah, he mentioned that he formed his entire division along Willoughby Run, which he didn't do. Um, uh, I forget some of the other things that he there had. There was one there. about uh, ordering the artillery to bombard Herp's Woods for a half an hour. Yeah, I, there, that simply didn't do that. Didn't happen. Right. I mean, he and may- you know what? I now l- let me ask you about this though, because I, I just started reading Morning at Willoughby Run. Have you yeah. read that? And he mm-hmm. mentions that that he ordered that Heath ordered because Archer, you know, he ordered Archer in, and Archer's like, "Well, I don't have any supports. Davis isn't up yet. You know, I don't like that." Okay, well, we'll have the artillery 
shell the the woods over to the right um, for about a half an hour. And then in the meantime, Davis came up and then they went in. Now, that's the way it is in that book. Is that true? Is that coming from Heath? Is Are we confusing two different things here? Or is that Heath's account of how it worked? I think that's that's coming from Heath. So um, that's not true. You, you don't have the ammunition if you are a Confederate artillery battery to shell a suspected position for 30 minutes. You do not have the ammunition to do that. Okay. You, what you're going to do, you may fire some shells at the woods just to see if anything comes out. Mm-hmm. You're not going to fire many. If you don't get a reply, you don't keep firing. So the, the idea, people are, again, thinking in terms of like World War One or World War Two. I mean, you had enough shells, you know, you're going to pulverize the woods, right. and then you're going to move up and see what happens. The other thing is, is that um, it's very possible that writing this in 1892, you're Henry Heath. Um, I think he, he did come back to the battlefield one time. In fact, he identified the tree that he was beside when he got shot in the head Mm -hmm. uh, during the fighting on July the 1st, he he bought this hat that was too big for him and he wrapped this newspaper in it so the hat would fit his head. And that absorbed the, it must have been a spent shot, but it knocked him unconscious for almost the rest of the day. Mm. And he was still so disabled from the wound, it may have given him a concussion that he couldn't command a division on July the 3rd. That's why Pettigrew commands a division. So he did come back here one time. But did Henry Heath know the difference between Herps Woods and the woods on Hare Ridge? I doubt it. Yeah. So when he yeah. says he shelled the woods, the first the first resistance that he meets, other than the picket post out uh out on um, Knoxland Ridge. Yeah. The, out west of town, mm-hmm. like five miles west of town. The first real resistance that he meets is on Hare Ridge, which is Buford's advanced line. That's the first resistance. So it's possible he brought a battery up and shelled the woods on Hare Ridge for a few minutes to see what sort of response that he got. And it's also possible that once they cleared that ridge and came up on Hare Ridge, that they did shell Herps Woods because that would be a likely spot for federal soldiers to uh, federal federal cavalrymen to take cover in, and that shelling that second one did elicit a response from Caleb's battery, which had two sections around the McPherson farm uh, north of Herps Woods, mm-hmm. and then that started a little bit of an artillery exchange, and that kind of helped for Heath develop the enemy position. But it's also possible when you look at the way. Heath commits his division, we can we can derive some conclusions from what he's doing. He has four brigades. He commits two brigades. He doesn't keep those two brigades in direct support of one another. Those two brigades diverge away from the Chambersburg Pike and away from each other. And the reason they diverge away from the pike is it's clear what both of those brigades are attempting to do is outflank the battery that they have been firing at them from near the McPherson farm. These are very standard tactics in the civil war. When you're up against a force that's just harassing you, you simply maneuver around them. They withdraw back to the next position and you keep maneuvering. There's no heavy fighting. You simply dislodge the enemy by maneuver. Hmm. It's clear to me what Heath is doing is he thinks He's come up against a force that he can easily handle with two brigades. He doesn't even bring his other two brigades up, Pettigrew and Brockenbrows. He only uses those two brigades. And he allows those brigades to move in a position that they are mutually unsupporting of one another. They cannot support each other. So when he gets hit by Reynolds' infantry, that's why he gets hammered so hard. He doesn't have any support to those brigades. Those brigades are isolated. They're able to be outflanked and they're able to be defeated and to suffer very heavy casualties. So it's clear to me that Heath, um, he mismanaged the advance. And, um, you know, the, the, the conclusion you draw from it, the lesson you learn from it is if you're going to exceed your orders and you're just going to go for it all, take everything you got. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't hold half of it back. <laughs> no, take everything you got uh, right. because – you know, by holding half of it back, uh, he did have something for his force to rally on, but he probably would not have suffered the defeat that he did 
had Pettigrew and Brockenbrough up, been up front and his brigade's been in a mutually supporting position because he had really good numbers based upon what the Federals could bring on the field. It was that he allowed his troops to be defeated piecemeal because of the way he committed them to this to this reconnaissance. So it's it's management more than anything else. It's it's management. And yeah. that is where and I think Heath knew that. He was experienced enough. He knew that. He knew that he had made mistakes. Mm. But um, he was not the sort of individual to go, hey, I'm going to hold my hand up and go, I'm going to claim this. And, uh, you know, I want history to remember that. I'm like, no, I don't. I don't want history to remember that. I, I want them to remember <laughs> this was a total surprise. We were just going to Gettysburg for shoes. And if I'd had Jeb Stewart there, none of this would happen. Right. So wh- is that behind why he denied that he ever encountered Buford's cavalry? Like, that, to me, was kind of well, he, interesting. He did later admit that he ran into Buford's cavalry. Mm-hmm. Um, he did admit that. I think in his memoirs, he admits that he ran into Buford's cavalry. Yeah. So he, the other thing about him that also is always a red flag is when somebody is starts to change their story. They're not consistent. There's not a consistency to the story. So if you, there are some consistencies between 1877 with Heath and his 1892. Mm-hmm. But when you look at 1877, the after action report, which he wrote in September of 1863, and you look at 1892, there are vast discrepancies in, in those documents. And that's always a red flag. So it's not even like minor things. It's like huge discrepancies between the different ones. Right. Yeah. Okay. Glaring right. discrepancies. Right. Yes. Because if you read his, uh, if you read his after action report, he writes in his after action report that it became clear to him as he neared Gettysburg, that the enemy had infantry, artillery, and cavalry in the area. Uh-huh. And the conclusion you draw from that statement is that the dismounted cavalry he may have thought was infantry. He saw cavalry and he was fired at with artillery. So he believes that all of those branches are in front of him. But Mm. he also believes, based upon the way he manages his division, that they're not in any sort of numbers that he can't handle with two brigades. Okay. What what is your favorite... uh aspect of the battle like what, what do you like to read about or write about most with Gettysburg <laughs> um I guess probably the uh the psychological experience of battle okay for soldiers yeah uh, rather than some specific place on the battlefield um I find the uh, kind of the John Keegan s face of battle to be very interesting to me um, and the uh, to get at more of how these men actually experience the battle than how we may want to wish they experienced it or sometimes particularly uh, in memoirs and reminiscences how soldiers often wrote for a for a, a popular audience mm. how they wanted people to remember these battles. So I find that interesting. Um, I've always found the opening of the battle to be really fascinating because yeah. the the decisions that are made are really critical and they are being made without a great deal of knowledge about where everybody is. Mm. Now, the Union Army, the Union Army has a, a big advantage in this area because uh A great deal of it has to do with Buford. I mean, Buford um, assembled a very accurate intelligence picture of the Confederate Army and where they were. So if you were John Reynolds or even John Buford or other federal commanders, you, one, knew where all of your army was. But you also had a pretty good idea where the entire Confederate Army was. Mm. The Confederate commanders did not have that. They had bad intelligence. So... You can criticize Jeb Stuart in this campaign. He did hurt the Confederates in that they were having to rely on spies to get information about where the Union Army was, and the intelligence information that they were receiving was outdated and wrong. What do you say to the argument that uh, Lee 
It's not that Lee didn't have cavalry. It's that he didn't use the cavalry he had. Um, I, what I say to that is, uh, yes, he had some cavalry. He did not have Jeb Stewart. And that makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. So it, you got uh, General Robertson. Um, you got Imboden. You can't count on them to get the close with the enemy. And also the other thing about Jeb Stewart that's very important is uh, the, the statement that Lee makes when he learns Jeb Stewart has been mortally wounded at Yellow Tavern is very telling. He never brought me a false piece of information. Mm. Mm. So what he's saying is he was a really good intelligence officer. Yeah. He was able to sift through all those reports that he's getting and put his finger on what was accurate. So I trusted Jeb Stewart. And that that's one of the things that Lee is missing. So if you're A.P. Hill, you're Henry Heath, you're any of these people, um, there's you are not aware of how close the Union Army is. And that sets the Confederates up. There's also, I mean, another thing that hurts the Confederate Army is there was a, um, and there was a, who wrote this? It was, um, it was Henry, I just forgot his name. He was a staff officer, Lewis Young. He's a staff officer for Pettigrew. Okay. At the, oh, yeah, who, who went up and told. Right, you know. Lewis Young. And one of the things that Lewis Young writes about is there was this, um, this, kind of spirit of disbelief mm -hmm. that gripped the high command of the army. They were very confident that wherever they ran into the Yankees, they were going to whip the Yankees. I mean, they were just a better army and they just had this record and they were on a high and they were rolling. And um, he recalled going to General Archer because he'd heard that Archer's brigade was going to lead the march on July the 1st. And he told Archer, he said there was this road that came in from the right. And I think he was probably referring to the Hare Ridge Road. Yeah. And he told Archer to be careful about that road because he said that gave the enemy a chance to come in on your flank. And he said Archer uh, just kind of dismissed him, more or less. That, um, you know, look, you weren't a Chancellorsville, and Fredericksburg and Antietam. And, you know, we got this. Yeah, all yeah. right. <laughs> we're not we're not worried about this. We got right. this. Although, I mean, in. Uh, as far as Archer goes, when uh, Heath orders Archer to move off of Hare Ridge to continue his advance, there is some evidence that Archer questioned the wisdom of moving his brigade forward alone and unsupported. Yeah. And Heath basically told him, you got nothing to worry about. You got well, plenty of manpower to handle anything that's going to be in your front. Go, go take care of this. Um, and you can you can see how I mean, you have this the other thing about these armies that is important to uh, keep in mind is these armies develop a culture hmm. and generally the culture uh, permeates its way down. Sometimes it can come from the bottom up, but oftentimes it comes down from the commander. And the culture of the Army of Northern Virginia is that um, you are encouraged to be aggressive. You are encouraged to be aggressive and you have a superior army to the enemy. And don't, you know, don't be stupid, but um, don't be cautious because caution gets you into more trouble than being aggressive does. OK, so if you're Henry Heath, you're thinking in terms of, you know, you're not worrying about how's history going to remember me on the morning of July the 1st. You're thinking in terms of, you know, my reputation within the army, you know, my my position within the army, my future in the Confederate States of America army. I mean, I want to make sure we're going to win a victory here. I'm going to, you know, this is going to bring glory to me and honor to me, and it's going to look good on my resume. And, um, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to come and thank me for being cautious. So I can, ha I can handle this. I, I've got the force to handle it. I'm just going to push these guys out of the way and, and take this position. And then when the whole thing, falls apart very badly <laughs> then, <laughs> then, then, you blame out something, <laughs> then you gotta figure out some way to explain it right? yeah yeah so now you 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 had earlier uh alluded to this that uh while the war's still going on after the battle uh there's kind of some rumblings about him you know messing it up for them is, is that what you were yeah yeah um it we don't have any um 
evidence that anybody wrote anything or said anything about Henry Heath. You can only um, you derive that from what he writes in 1877. Okay. You derive that he's sensitive. There's something there about Heath's management of the battle at Gettysburg, because after these uh, after these engagements, there's always, you know, particularly when you get defeated, everybody's looking around for what happened. So mm-hmm. when you think about the Confederate Army, I mean, people were um, blaming Ewell. They were blaming Jeb Stewart. They were blaming James Longstreet. There was all this blame that was going around. And, um, you know, everybody had an opinion about why we had lost the Battle of Gettysburg, because most people in the Army of Northern Virginia were clear that they had lost the battle, yeah. that the campaign had failed. So, um, um, so that's, you know, I think that's that kind of drives why people, you know, feel the way they do there. So do you think, uh, your opinion, uh, do you think that uh, Heath and Hill were being... Well, I guess let's say Hill because he was the one that uh, ordered it. Uh, was he being careless and reckless and, uh, you know, not listening? I mean, the, the idea that um, a guy who was just where I want to go comes back and says, uh, there's some troops there, you know, there's something going on, and, you know, and I don't go and investigate or, well, I mean, I guess I do, right? The, I send the whole division the next day. Mm-hmm. Um but even though I just came from the top, it's it's kind of like a Chancellorsville on the right. Like uh, nobody wants to believe these reports that there's right. a huge force over right. on the right because guys on the bottom don't know. It's the guys on the top who know because they're getting all the information coming in. But the guys on the bottom are actually seeing it. They're saying, I'm looking right at, you know, here right. it is. Um, right. Like, I guess I guess the, the short question is, who do you blame or do you blame no one or do you blame um, Robert Lee? Well, I mean, there's, there's, uh, as they say, plenty of blame to go around. I mean, Jeb Stewart does bear some responsibility here because if Stewart had stayed with the army and been screening the Federals, the Federals, number one, would not have been able to gather as accurate information about where the Confederates mm-hmm. were as they did. Yeah. And number two... <clears throat> Uh, Stewart probably would have identified where major Union Army formations were and kept Lee informed. That's a big game changer if you're Lee. Uh, I don't necessarily blame Lee in this because if you are Army commander and AP Hill tells you, hey, here's my plan for tomorrow. Here's the report that I've received. Here's what I'm going to do. You look at the plan and you're like, uh, you know, based on all my intelligence, there's no real danger of a battle here. The only thing I want to make sure, and I have impressed this upon AP Hill really clearly, don't bring on a general engagement, right? Mm -hmm. Don't bring on a general until the whole army is assembled. I want to determine where we're going to fight the battle. You have to believe, again, there is, I mean, these people, a lot of this stuff is said. It's not written down. You have to believe that AP Hill uh, makes it clear to Henry Heath, do not bring on an engagement. If it is if it is enemy cavalry in your path, drive them out of the way. You're relying on a, Henry Heath's judgment here. You're relying on his judgment. Don't bring on an engagement. Okay, can you open up Hardy's tactics or Casey's tactics and find in there how you don't bring on a general engagement? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's not in the manual, right? <laughs> right. It, it's not there. Right. So it, you're relying on the judgment of that division commander. And um, there is some circumstantial evidence that Heath did get orders. If it's cavalry, drive them out of the way. If it's infantry, halt and report back for orders. I don't know that he actually got that. I have to think that he, he Hill did warn him against bringing on a general engagement. Mm-hmm. So um, if you're Henry Heath... <clears throat> I get the fact that you're you've got this culture. You, you got to be aggressive. You think that the enemy is not that strong in front of you, but here's where I can I, I would criticize Heath. You don't know what they have, so okay. you you should proceed carefully. 
Mm -hmm. You are not supposed to bring on a general engagement. Don't push two brigades way out there in front into, you know, enemy territory without knowing what you're getting into. You better bring everybody up, bring your artillery up, bring all your infantry up, keep a really strong force so that if you have to go over to the defensive, it's easy to do. And you can hold your position until Pender's division comes up. So I think that uh, Heath mismanages the opening engagement. And where Heath mismanages it, Reynolds manages it exactly right. Mm. And so does Buford. Buford, yeah. So it's the combination of on the federal side, they manage it really well. And on the Confederate side, they manage it poorly. And then that precipitates this general engagement that once then you become engaged, then, and, you know, some people will say, well, okay. I mean, you know, when AP Hill arrived and he came up with Pender's division, well, then they could have just disengaged. Well, then it's a different ball game now, because now if you're AP Hill, you know, from prisoners that the first core is in front of you. Mm-hmm. Is there another core in front of you? Mm-hmm. If you start to withdraw, you now render everything vulnerable because you've got four divisions kind of moving into the area. Right. You can't withdraw. Right. You, you got, you got to fight. You got a battle now. So he's, he's got a battle on his hands. Heath has brought on a battle. The only way you could have avoided the battle is if Heath had disengaged immediately and pulled back to a defensive position, like on schoolhouse Ridge farther to the West and, and reported back to Hill and let Hill make the decision. Right. Yeah, you just no. hold hold the line and then right. wait for orders. Right. What, but at the same but at the same time, you know, I I do understand the culture of why Henry Heath attempts an aggressive movement. I think the mistake that he makes is in attempting the aggressive movement with only half of his force is what got him into real trouble. What do you make of uh cuz you always hear about how as they're marching from Cashtown uh Pegram's battalion leads the way. Um and I think it was uh, we brought this up on a previous show and Tim Smith said, "Yeah, but we think it was probably just a section of guns." Um yeah. wh- wh- what's the story with that? I mean, and and the other thing that I uh, believe is to be true is that they led the way until they got to their own skirmish line. And then infantry went up ahead. Is that correct? Am I, I, don't, I, don't that think right? I don't think there's any way that Pegram's entire battalion was at the front of the division. I think um, there very well may have detached a – because, again, think in terms of you're Henry Heath. You're trying to organize a reconnaissance in force against what you believe is a light observation force. Mm-hmm. So what do you need to disperse that light observation force? You need skirmishers. And you need a section of artillery, Mm -hmm. maybe a battery, which is going to be four guns, Mm -hmm. two sections, right? That's all you're going to need because that battery can shell the enemy. If you see the enemy a mile away, you can shell the enemy and they're going to retreat. They're not going to stay there and get shelled because they're not in. So um, that then somebody along the line says, you know, it was Pegram's battalion. Well, it wasn't Pegram's battalion. It was a battery of Pegram's battalion that may have been behind the skirmish line. They're not going to be in front of the skirmish line, uh, was behind the skirmish line. That makes complete sense to me because of the nature of the operation. If they thought that they were going to run into some real serious resistance, those batteries would have been behind the infantry. So I, or maybe I, sandwich in the middle of the infantry. Right, right, like put a, yeah. a unit up front. I, I yeah. always kind of took that to be a, an attempt at whoever's pointing it out to illustrate how careless Heath was being. Yeah, yeah, I think, and I don't think, I don't think Heath was being careless in that respect because, um, you know, one of the other uh, things about the opening of the Battle of Gettysburg, and this has been dramatically shaped in people's minds by the movie Gettysburg. They imagine that the the engagement between Buford and Heath was this pitched battle like the Alamo, right? Uh, Whereas the reality is um, the guy who commanded the skirmish line, uh, Burkett Fry, who was a uh, colonel of the 13th Alabama, Burkett Fry wrote a letter to John Batchelder, I think in the late 1870s, And he said in the letter that um, the resistance that they received from the cavalry was inconsequential. Yeah. 
He said, we just pushed them right out of the way. It was really easy, which is exactly what the cavalry was supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. I mean, they all they're doing is harassing you. They're not going to stand and fight and die. And the only place that the cavalry puts up starts to put up any um, Stick getting resistance. Real resistance is along Hare Ridge. But even there, the numbers that are coming at them, they, they're not going to stand and fight. I mean, because if you're if you're a cavalryman, even if you're the commander of that skirmish line, what are your orders? What have they told you? Does Don't somebody come up and tell you that, guess what? We're going to fight the biggest battle of the Civil War here. No, <laughs> nobody has to do that. <laughs> so you're just operating on resist them. Don't lose many men. Right. So the um, Buford's division on July the 1st loses, I think, 112 killed, wounded, and captured. The whole division. Yeah. The majority of those casualties all occur in the afternoon of July the 1st when they are fighting Colonel Abner Perrin's brigade. That's the, when they're fighting in positions south of the Hager Sound Road. They get into a real fight there against two regiments of Perrin's brigade. And that's where Buford's cavalry suffers most of its casualties. They suffered very, very few casualties in the morning engagement. Uh, just uh, literally a handful of casualties. And the same thing with the Confederates. Uh, mm-hmm. they, they suffered very few losses as well. So that all tended to um, reinforce the idea, if you were Burkett Fry or you were Henry Heath or any of these other guys, there's nothing in front of us that we can't handle. But now, now Burkett Fry says it was inconsequential, but it did take him like, what, an hour and a half, two hours to actually get to McPherson's Ridge? Or it did. Ridge. I mean, the thing is, it, the also the thing to keep in mind is that, um, you know, your skirmishers aren't running forward. Your skirmishers are moving cautiously, right. carefully. They're probing in buildings. They're going over fences through cornfields and uh, wheat fields and through woods. And and uh, there's evidence from Pettigrew's brigade that at one point during the advance uh, on the Chambersburg Pike, that Buford sent a mounted regiment around to uh, threaten the flank of the marching column. And I, I, it's very possible he did this. What he did is he sent a mounted force out. And it could have just been part of the 8th Illinois Cavalry. Mm-hmm. But it was a feint. It was just a feint. But, but Pettigrew actually halted his brigade and deployed an entire regiment off to the flank. Well, you think about the time it takes. Yeah. Halt your men. Deploy an entire regiment. Have them march out a little ways. Watch the cavalry ride off. And then you're like, oh, you know what? We need to put more flankers out. So you can only move as fast as the flankers. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of reasons. Uh, I don't fault Heath for how long it took to march from uh, Cashtown to Hare Ridge. I think that uh, without any cavalry, he had to make that movement really carefully. And he was really careful. Well, and that's what was so good about Buford's plan was he knew it would take long for them to get online and all this other stuff. So, and, and it was, uh, and you know, the terrain worked out in his favor too. Yes. And, uh, it was great. Um, all right. The name of the article is romances of Gettysburg. Get those shoes. It's a two parter. I'll leave the link in the description, but, uh, you know, if you don't click on that, just go and Google it. It's, uh, as, as always, it's a very interesting read and it, uh, it really, uh, I love busting myths, um, you know, because uh, some th- myths, uh, they annoy me. I feel like I'm being played a fool for believing a yeah. myth, you know? So yeah. I love when somebody comes along and busts it, and I'm like, yeah, now I feel like I'm like I'm <laughs> armed with knowledge or something. So this was uh, interesting to do. Scott, thank you very much. Uh, now that you're uh, all vaccinated, maybe next time you can come into the studio and check it out. It's... Um, well, I wouldn't say it's better than the studio you were at last time, but it's uh, it's would. you would say that, Eric. I would. Well, because because we worked really hard at the yeah. drywall, but uh, it's a studio. It's something. Oh, yeah. so, well, <laughs> come on, good. In. yeah. I, I, I'm vaccinated now. I'll definitely come in there next time. Yeah, very good. Um, it was great talking to you again, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for listening. All right, thanks a lot, Scott. Yep, Matt. I appreciate it.